On this episode of How'd You Get Here, we talk with Denver United pastor Rob Brendel. We hear how he started from his basement and grew a very successful church. I hope you enjoy this. Rob, thanks so much for coming on the show today. I really appreciate it. <laughs> uh, pleasure and an honor. <laughs> Great. Awesome. Well, hey, um, you know, this show is all about encouraging people to let them know that they're not so far away from where they want to be, and they have what is, they have what it takes to, to get there, you know? And I think in life, we get so discouraged, and we um, are always afraid of uh, how things are going to work out, or if I take these risks or do these things, um, is it going to have a positive or negative effect on my life? And we think about all these things, and a lot of times that just paralyzes us, you know? And so really, uh, when I thought about starting the show, I really wanted it to be about where I could interview different types of people from all spectrum of uh, creativity and business and um, self-employed type people to, to hear their stories. Because I, I think the more and more that I, I, I hear people's stories, the more I start to realize, like, wow, you know, you're just an average guy doing your thing, and you took risks, and you kind of ended up where you are now. And you look back and you say, wow, that, that's pretty amazing, you know, that I, I got here. And so, um, you know, really, I, I just want to talk to you about your journey and kind of a little bit of how you grew up, where you came from, and all that stuff. So, so Pastor Rob, first, where did you grow up? What part of, you know, the United States did you grow up? And, and what, what, what were you like as a kid? And what was your life kind of like? Sure. Well, I claim New England okay. as home. It's where I lived longer than anywhere else prior to moving to Colorado. My dad was in the Army. Real quick, are you a Patriots fan then? I am not. I was a Patriots so fan friendly. of the Steve Grogan, Mosey Tatupu, awful Patriots <laughs> years. Um, but I just have a thing about cheating okay. and surliness and <laughs> surly cheaters. Okay. I don't like. Okay, so just, that's off the table. <laughs> no one has to question yeah. your loyalty. Yeah, otherwise there's a, there's a predisposition against me. Right. So, okay. So you said your dad was in the military. Yep. So as an army kid, uh, everyone who's a citizen of army nation understands moving around, making home wherever you land. And when I was 10, my father got out of the service, took a job with a defense contractor, and we landed in Andover, Massachusetts. As outsiders to an insider culture, my parents came from the South and that was kind of our family heritage. So I, I started my life as a fish out of water and just kind of learned to be okay there. So when you were younger, did you travel a lot then because your dad was in the military or did you kind of have a home base and he was just gone a lot? No, we did. We moved around. Um, I think the most exciting place that my family was, was uh, in Germany, you know, in the seventies, early eighties, we had a strong military presence there. And so we got to see Europe. Of course, most of that I, I know through photos because I was, my continuous memory had not started. Yeah. Um, my dad took a job at the Pentagon and settled down kind of in the army smart guy lane where you, you get a, to be an exception to the rule of moving every couple of years. Mm -hmm. So we had some stability in Northern Virginia, uh, Fairfax County, where I was uh, the same kind of different as everyone else. And that, that worked. And then New England was a, was a sort of rude awakening around the age of 10 hmm. in fourth grade. Fourth grade. That's an interesting time too, because you're starting to develop more, you're being more self-aware and all that kind of stuff. So then, so New England, fourth grade, and then, and then from there you just... I mean, where, where are we at now? So. Yeah, so I went to uh, um, the local school. My parents sent me to a prep school for high school, um, Phillips Academy, uh, which is a prestigious school. I didn't really know that. I just kind of went where they said to go. It was mm -hmm. in our town. Um, my my graduation speaker from high school was mm -hmm. the president. Oh, wow. Like, of the United States. And so that's the <laughs> kind of school it was. My classmates were senators, kids, and the children of oil emirates and things like that. So it, yeah. was, a, it was a heady time. Mm. I went from being an outsider in one world where everybody kind of talked like Matt Damon and had lived there <laughs> um, for four generations since their family immigrated from Ireland and I wasn't them, to another environment where everybody got chauffeured back from spring break in limousines and helicopters and I was not like them. So got kind of used to being different Yeah, and had to figure out how to be okay with that and function. Yeah. So when you, when you were young in school, what, I mean, what, did your parents put you in private school then for mm -hmm. any particular reason or they just wanted... You yeah, know. so I, I think uh, as I've begun in my 40s to access my back pages and understand my heart, what I've learned is that the culture of my family was to succeed. Hmm. So I was a sort of overachiever kid, 
And um, that's what – that was the best version of success was to go to this prestigious private school. And they meant well. I mean, they wanted me to to have opportunities they didn't have and to have a great education. And uh, and surely I got that and, and a lot else as well along the way. Yeah. Uh, so did you – did you have trouble with like bullies or anything like that? Or were you, did you kind of keep to yourself or? No, I was, I was very social, okay. um, played sports, did okay in school. Um, so found a way to fit in, yeah. um, realized sort of early in life that most people weren't like everyone else and were trying to hide it. And so just kind of figured out how, how not to have to hide it. Yeah. Um, it was a, it was a school where success looked like going to a, a prestigious college. The, right. Your existence was, was to prepare you for that. Like, you know, 20 kids from my high school class went to Harvard, stuff like that. Wow. Uh, I left New England because I, uh, you know, the Matt Damon factor and just being tired of, you know, how you like them apples kind of culture. <laughs> so, so um, um, and I didn't want to be in my parents' backyard and have my mom show up to my dorm room with cookies. So I went to Duke, <laughs> okay. um, which is sort of like, like that, but in, in the South and right. figured I'd see what, what that Southern culture is all about. Mm-hmm. And that's really where I came to know Jesus uh, as such. So did you, did you grow up? In, in the Christian faith, or did you, was it, you know, Christian because we're all Christian kind of thing, or was it pretty strong? Yes, yeah, so we didn't talk a whole lot about ourselves. Um, a lot of this I've pieced together from the outside in and circumstantially, but uh, my parents were sincere and are um, yeah. dear Christian believers. They came from more of a cultural Southern Baptist Christianity, as best I understand it, mm-hmm. uh, and genuinely had a what in the '70s would have been called a born again experience mm-hmm. um, when my dad was in the service. And um, however, we landed in a place where there wasn't a, a thriving evangelical culture, and maybe still isn't. And so um, my folks, uh, out of their army experience, learned to find the best of what's around and be local. So we went to a church that had a big white steeple and a really old organ and sang songs that were written in the 1700s. And, right. <laughs> and uh, the basement of the church was musty, and the cups were styrofoam, and your mom's lipstick stuck to them, and <laughs> you drank coffee that was Folgers, and you stuck a couple quarters in the slit in the top of the rubber can. Okay. And that was church. So it was, above all things, not fun and not anything you imagined yourself self wanting to do when you grew up. <laughs> it was about as, as accessible and appealing a, a career field as like being a dentist, where my dentist right. had corduroy pants with ducks embroidered on them. And, yeah. you know, and the pastor would say things like, may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. And you knew it was important, but in a vague, not relevant to me right. sense. Yeah. So, so then when you're around all these successful people in high school, and then you go off to college and Duke, at the end of high school, did you start to have a sense of what you wanted to be or, you know, what did, you know, you wanted to do with your life? I mean, obviously, especially if you're in a place where they're grooming you to to be a certain level of success, you know, by the time you get to college, are you thinking, yeah, I want to be a businessman or, I mean, what are your... So I went off to college thinking all kinds of things, yeah. various concepts of successful um, was what I wanted and was, was bred to want. Uh, I, I imagined... I went to college on an army ROTC scholarship. I lived in a world of wealthy kids and didn't come from a wealthy family. I didn't want my parents paying my college debt till they were dead. And I certainly didn't want to. So I got a scholarship doing what I knew, which was, uh, you know, uh, the family heritage of of schlepping weapons around (laughs) in camouflage early in the morning. And and that's what I did. I I lived a, a normal Duke student's life by day, but by night and early in the morning, I would traipse through the Duke Forest with rubber M16s and say hua and things like that are very non me. Yeah. Um, but it's that's hard to I imagine school. you like that. So I, I in a way didn't <laughs> yes, it's hard for me to imagine myself like that. It was like a four year uh, alternate life. But the fact is it paid for college. I got some yeah. good experience. I had some grow up time, but I didn't have the luxury of being able to be whatever I wanted. I couldn't do a gap year. There was no semester abroad. I couldn't go be a ski bum or live in a in a tiny apartment in New York for a year while that's right. you know, cool. I, I just just had to be in the army. Um, so I did my best to be high ranked in the army and get to choose where I wanted to go mm-hmm. because there's a lot of places that you don't really want to go. Yeah. Like, I don't know exactly where Fort Polk, Louisiana is, except <laughs> Louisiana. So that automatically put it in the negative for me. Right? <laughs> right. Uh, and same with like, I don't know where Fort Riley, Kansas is beyond <laughs> Kansas, which right. holistically didn't appeal. And yeah. so when I saw Fort Carson, Colorado, it stood out like a beacon in the night. I grew up skiing, uh, yeah. you know, in New England on the hard pack. And then I came out here and I'm like, wow, you can do it on snow. <laughs> Who knew all <laughs> these <hurt>. years? <laughs> like, say, well, how does that work? <laughs> so Colorado was, um, was, was sort of my salvation okay. and made those four years uh, wonderful. 
So what did what did you major in in college? Then? Civil engineering. Okay. Yeah, uh, I spent a lot of you, my fellow taxpayers, dollars um, <laughs> to figure out what I did not want to be when I grew up, uh, and then I paid you back by blowing things up with tanks for four years, which <laughs> further underscored what I did not want to do when I grew up. <laughs> uh, but you got to study something. And right. while my love was uh, British and early American literature, the army wasn't awarding um, scholarships in that area in right. quite as um, high abundance. <laughs> they wanted quantitative analytical disciplines. And my dad gave me the, son, there's nothing you can do with a liberal arts degree that you can't do with an engineering degree speech. But the opposite is decidedly less true, right? So, <laughs> right. I, that, that, so I ended up studying like, uh, I took whole semester classes on things like concrete and dirt uh, <laughs> with other civil engineering um, students. Wow. And so during that time, you, obviously doing your four years of, of the military service, you were like, I don't want to do that. And then after you get this degree in civil engineering, I mean, what were you thinking at that point? I mean, were you, did you start to feel lost or? <laughs> yeah, you know, somehow I never felt lost. I probably felt overfound. I had like six <laughs> life plans right. um, stacked up on each other and I figured a couple of them will pan out. Well, the thing I thought I would do, you know, I grew up with a grandmother who was kind of that um, special influence in my life. And she used to say, boy, this boy can talk in her Southern accent. And she said, um, son, you're either going to be a lawyer or a preacher. And for the, the reasons aforementioned, being a preacher um, was somewhat less inspiring. And so I figured I'll be a lawyer. Yeah. So I thought I would spend four years blowing things up with tanks as the army asked and then let them send me to law school, um, serve for a couple more years, and then um, be a lawyer, uh, and then run for political office, um, where I get to talk and be wonderful. Yeah. Uh, that seemed great to me and influential. Uh, yeah. That's what I, what I thought I wanted, right? Yeah. So um, to say that ministry as a vocation or career path never crossed my mind, I mean, it never even entered the realm of possibility at that point. So I figured I'd get out, ski, um, blow things up with tanks, uh, defend freedom, follow in my family's hallowed footsteps, uh, make my dad and grandfather proud, and then go on to be Tom Cruise. In, uh, yeah, that's right. Right. <laughs> there was a very brief window as an aside, a very important aside for other children. You can't of the truth. <laughs> there, there was a there was a small time window during which I I didn't live under the roof of any woman who, while drawing breath, would not allow me to have such a motorcycle. Yeah. Like my mom, and then my wife, even my sister wanted to weigh in on that. So there was a brief window when um, Maverick's uh, just impossibly cool life of yeah. white t-shirt leather jacket and crotch rocket was possible. Yeah. And during that window, I did get the motorcycle. Nice. My life expectancy <laughs> um, subsequently dropped from like 37 years to two. And I, I defied the odds and survived. That's awesome. That's awesome. All right. So then you're in Colorado here, um, finishing out your service. And are you involved? Are you starting to get involved in church? Or, you know, how did, with your faith to me sounding kind of like just a part of you, like it's, yeah, I was born into this and this is what I'm, how, how did you get to that place of almost that next level of faith where, you know what I'm saying? Or church or ministry as a yeah, career. Yeah, where it's like, like all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian. I mean, right. my, my, my wife grew up in the South, or she didn't grow up in the South, but she went to school in North Carolina and, you know, she went to a, a private school, played Division One soccer, and, but everybody was a Christian. You know, right. It's like, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. We're, not, we're everybody's a Christian. Right. It's like identifying with a political party or right. something like yeah. that. Like, so it, it really, there was a progressive development of faith becoming my own, right under my own nose. I never set out to to decide on Jesus whether he's true, he's a lunatic, or he's a liar, or I'm chucking him completely. It was yeah. just a more organic for me, right? But I got in with a group of students who I really liked and enjoyed. Uh, who are a part of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, which is a non-denominational, kind of major on the majors, minor on the theological minors, uh, and have fun, Jesusly kind of group. Mm -hmm. And and that was my community, um, discovered that this is who I was all along, and started growing to understand uh, the Bible, um, how who God is and what that means for my life. And um, about halfway through my college experience, to backtrack slightly, this is an important um, step in the journey. I took a summer and went to Africa on a mission trip. I had a prestigious internship lined up with the Big Dig, which got finished up like a year and a half ago, uh, which is amazing because this was in like the er 
early mid nineties that this mm. was happening. But, uh, I w- anyway, uh, I forego- forewent that internship with an engineering firm, uh, and prestige in Boston to my parents' dismay and took the summer and went to Africa on a mission trip where I, I shadowed a pastor, um, in East Africa and followed him around, uh, between and among the probably 20, 25 villages mm. in, in very rural Kenya where he shepherded churches. And I had a, a transformational, uh, inexplicable apart from faith experience that went on to shape um, the course of my life. Interesting. So there I was following this man around. Let me just take you yeah, there. I, um, like to hear we, that. I was so I was Presbyterian by church culture. So I, as a disclaimer, was not used to God speaking to me per se or anybody for that matter. That yeah. wasn't part of the of the experience. <laughs> um, and and so we were walking from one village to the next, maybe twenty miles. You know, in, in the name of cultural sensitivity, we were wearing long pants and shirts in Africa in the summer. And I, I was not um, feeling very uh, spiritual. Mm-hmm. It was probably thinking about the blister forming on my heel or something <laughs> like that. We stopped for a breather. I walked up over the berm, looked out across the East African plains, and boom, I, I, I heard, sensed, how do you describe it? it um, unmistakably detected um, in my heart this. You're not going to do the things you think you're going to do. Mm-hmm. You're going to serve me for the rest of your life, and you're going to love it. Was that Boom, sc- and it was gone. Was that scary? Do you, was, it was, it was I can imagine. surprising. It was kind of surprising, like when Luke's in the droid shop cleaning up uh, R2, and then boom, Princess yeah. Leia comes out, and she's like, help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. And then, you know, he only sees a flash, but all of a sudden at once, it was exhilarating more than scary because his entire universe expanded. And now he saw his life in a broader context than fixing moisture vaporizers and bullseyeing womp rats in Beggar's Canyon, right? Now yeah. he's seeing the, the universe and his possible place in it. And then it's like, bring it back. Play back the entire message. That's how I felt. I was like, wait, what else? What next? Right. I remember kind of walking into that space thinking, is this literally that dirt, like <laughs> holy ground? I remember the, the flannel graph and the Moses and the burning bush, and I'm right. like, take off your sandals. This is So I tried like putting my foot there and then taking it back and standing there again and nothing. So I was left for several more years before the next installment of the download from heaven to figure out what does that mean? I just knew that not what I was thinking I would do wasn't true. I just knew it wasn't complete. It wasn't mm-hmm. enough. Maybe I did this but I did it for God. You know, it's like by day, um, success man who went to this prestigious prep school and, and was an uh, overachiever um, personified, but by night, Cape Crusader for Jesus. Didn't know what that was going to look like. Right. And then landed here in Colorado and started attending a church where I met my wife and a pastor who reframed local church ministry in, in my imagination. Interesting. Wow, that's pretty cool. So you have this moment in Africa where you hear God, essentially, and you're like, okay. like So at that point, when you came back home from that trip, were you praying harder? Were you, were you seeking more? I mean, were you trying to hear that voice again to be like, all right, now what's the next steps? Or did yeah. you find that yeah. things just opened up and kind of started moving oh, in that no. direction? Oh, I, no. I, like all true overachieving kids from New Jersey North, I was impatient and thought, all right, I just need to figure it out. Take that, grab the bull by the horns, and make it happen. You know, God can't steer a parked car. That was kind of <laughs> the the mantra worldview I came from. Yeah. So I came back, and I would, I would be my sensitivities to God and the promises of the universe were heightened. So I'd be in a church service, and, you know, where before I would just simply kind of go along and worship. Now I was like, God, use me earnestly. And then a little later, I'd be like, I'd put the hands in the air and like close my eyes. God, use me. And then a third time, like falling to my knees, my head to the rising sun with a twinge of vibrato, God, use me. And then one day it kind of hit me, and maybe this is God, maybe this is just maturing, but it occurred to me that however earnest and zealous my prayers were, they were a little meaningless, maybe even foolish, because the thing about God is asking him to use you is kind of like asking fire to be hot or like asking water to be wet. Right. You know, it's by nature hot and it's by nature wet. And God by his nature uses people. So the, the more meaningful prayer sort of occurred to me would be, God, m- make me useful. Like, what do I need to be doing to be that guy that you showed me you want me to be? Mm-hmm. Are you just going to like wave a magic wand and I get transported to um, calling fulfillment land? Or, or is it more organic than that? And so that was the journey of the next seven, eight, ten years, figuring mm-hmm. out how to be useful in the hands of the person who I felt 
uh, had called me. Now, I realize the X factor to my story thus far is the, the experience with God, and that may be unique to my worldview and understanding of faith. But every entrepreneur, right, has that moment of spark, that moment yeah. of inspiration. And uh, I mean, you can substitute yours, right, if, if, if it makes more sense to you. But I think the building blocks of the process are common to yeah. entrepreneurs. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think, you know, I think that you're laying in bed, you're taking a shower or something like that, and you have that moment of inspiration sure. or the idea. The apple falls on your head. Yeah. You slip on the ice and then... It's like, I could make rubber shoes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. um, so after school, you're living in Colorado Springs, you're done with college, and you're going to this church... Um, at that point, are you working a day job or are you? Oh yes, I'm in the army. That is okay, my day that's job. That's your day job. So okay. I wear camouflage and um, okay. go through Train. battle maneuvers and things like that. It was a very different world than I've ever experienced before or since. But uh, I don't regret a day of it. You know, yeah. I mean, I I turned in my gear on my four year anniversary of uh, of date of service. I fulfilled my commitment and I never looked back. But that was my day job. But by night, I would attend church and I became increasingly fascinated with this church that wasn't, um, didn't have a big steeple and didn't have sing songs that were written in the 1700s. Yeah, and drums and, and... It, right. And I didn't even know if, if, if Jesus like, uh, regarded electric guitars <laughs> and drums or understood that, but they all seemed to be, uh, to love God. And it was much more accessible, much more, um, uh, relevant to my life. And for the first time, in spite of myself, I started to be able to imagine uh, a life doing something like mm. this. Uh, and so by night, my m- my occupation, if you will, was helping with the youth group. I had a okay. value bred into me by my dad that if you're going to be around, uh, you're either part of the solution or you're part of the problem. So help out. Uh, the pastor stood up one Sunday and said, hey, our kids are going on a summer camp or retreat. We need some adult chaperones. I thought, well, I can do that. Um, so I took a little leave from the army and went and and chaperoned teenagers in, in the mountains, and that parlayed into leading a, a small group of kind of of um, a Bible study and, and mentorship for teenage boys. And I did that for the last couple of years of my time in the army through this uh, through this local church, and that's actually the context in which I met my wife. Interesting. So then after that, you kind of just went straight into ministry then. I mean, essentially, did you get hired on or did you become like a youth pastor or something like that then? At this yes. Church? So uh, I was getting to the end of my time in the Army, not knowing what was going to come next. I resigned my commission and uh, didn't know how this was going to proceed. But I figured for the first time in my life, I had choice about who I would be when I grew up, and I was going to leave the door open for that voice to to reemerge, manifest, or or show me the next step. And uh, my pastor, who I'd gotten to know because his teenage son at the time was in one of in that group of mentor mentorship group for boys. Um, called me up in my office, which uh, was unexpected to say the least, and said, what are you doing when you get out of the army? And, and I said, I, to be honest with you, I don't really know, but I feel mm-hmm. like I had this sort of bizarre, surreal experience that suggested that I do something more vo- full-time for God. And he said, well, would you pray about coming to work for me? So I did, and I did. And I was yeah. essentially an aide de camp. So I went from working on a general staff in the army to working on a general staff in Christianity. This guy was pastoring a church of eight or 10,000, and um, his influence outside the walls of the church had grown such that he needed someone to do what I knew how to do, hmm. uh, never imagining that that would then uh, translate into a, a pastoral vocation. Um, but that's how, that's how my foot got in the door, I guess. Wow. Yeah, yeah, so I carried the bags and made the arrangements and was essentially a, a, a general's aide to yeah. a, an influential pastor. Wow. Okay. So then you're, you're living that life. You're feeling pretty fulfilled. You, you find your wife at this point, and you're kind of doing what you feel God has called you to do, firing on all cylinders, feeling great. Um, and then at what point do you take that, you know, why do you stop a good thing to go start your own church? Yeah, right. Well, the over the course of eight wonderful years, um, a, a sense of my identity and uh, of calling started to emerge in me. I had never preached to anyone ever. I, I was the guy that was like, I would grip the 
table with white knuckles when I had to recite the Gettysburg Address in English class, you know. But one day he he asked me, and I, I don't know if he saw something in me, but that is my boss. Hey, how would you like to? He called me on Friday, like Friday night of two days before Sunday fame, <laughs> and said, "Would you? How'd you like to take the service on Sunday?" And totally gridlocked, I didn't know. I didn't know. What he, I mean, take the service, take pictures of the service. What does that even mean? <laughs> right? And so dumbfounded, he he uh, says, "Preach. How would you like to preach?" And before my head could catch up, I said, "Yeah." Uh, not knowing what I was getting myself into or that I was stumbling onto the first day of the rest of my life, right? So we had a property on our uh, church grounds called the World Prayer Center. Mm -hmm. And that night I checked myself into one of the prayer hotel rooms in the World Prayer Center, figuring if ever I needed the prayers of the entire (laughs) world, it's now. What have I done? This is lunacy. (laughs) I don't know how to do this. But I had one of those out-of-body surreal experiences, kind of like when you're a kid and you dreamed that you're Michael Jordan and it's game seven and there's 10 seconds left and you get the ball, but you're not nervous because you're good. Right. It was like that. It was like, I knew what to do. And I looked at myself going, Oh, where did that, how did I, how did this even happen? Uh, but I've been doing it ever since thousands of times. And it's, it's, who knew part of how I was wired and what I was made to do. So that progressed to get to your question over the course of the next few years. And, um, now real quick, did you start out maybe, Talk, you you started out talking to teenagers, right? I mean, mm-hmm. is that kind of where you hone those skills a little bit? Kind of on the on the triple A team or you know the B team? I guess, but this was like single A ball. This was like <laughs> seven kids sitting around that round table in the corner at Cracker Barrel yeah. over Uncle Herschel's favorite. <laughs> I mean, this is not preaching, right? right this right. is talking about the Bible to seven teenagers. Mm-hmm. A very different thing than standing in front of. 8,000 people with cameras swinging and all that stuff. And so it was kind of like looking back and trying to figure out what just happened. It was kind of like Daniel, um, Mr. Miyagi saying like wax the antique cars and sand the deck and paint the fence. And he's like, but when do I get to learn to fight? Like when I learn karate and the Mr. Miyagi's (laughs) like, yeah. And then his like wax application motion perfectly deflects the punch. And he realized he's been learning it all all along and just didn't know. That's kind of what I think (laughs) happened. I had been learning it because like in the army, as as a 23-year-old lieutenant, you're tasked with giving an operations order, right, for a tank battle to grizzly hardened sergeants, and they know that you know that you know that they know that what you're telling them how to do, they've been doing since you were in kindergarten, and they're looking at you, and you got to figure out how to stand in front of them, and on the one hand, be humble enough to acknowledge their superior experience and expertise, but authoritative enough not to be mousy and over-deferential and get shot in the back, and right. that unique, weird combination of authority and humility that you learn as a survival instinct uh, in a, as a second lieutenant in a combat arms branch of the army comes back to be very relevant when you stand in front of a group of several thousand people to teach them a Bible story that you know that they know that they know that you know <laughs> that they've been teaching since you were in kindergarten. Right. There's this combination of humility that says, I get that you are older, wiser, and more experienced in this, and I honor that, with authority that says, I don't care if, if I look... 15 or if I am 15, God asked me to stand up here and teach this. And by, uh, by his grace and to the best of my ability, make no mistake, I'm going to do it. So after that first time that you, you preach on the big stage, <laughs> were you like freaked out afterwards? Like, Oh my gosh, I can't believe I did that. Or like, that was amazing. Or that was so awesome. I want to keep doing that. I mean, what? Yeah, I, was, I was more freaked out. It was, so my boss came to me and said, well, that was, was it, really... wait, first of all, was it a good talk i mean, I mean did you crush it like i, I, I mean what so i'm if a christian watched right? it today I'm, I'm, I'm imagine listeners i'm like i'm cam newton like pointing up to heaven you know like <laughs> god crushed it right but yeah. i mean it turned out to be this is back in the era this dates me of cassette tapes remember sermon tapes yeah the h- second highest selling sermon tape in that church's history uh who wow. who who would have ever thunk right Ooh, so I, I think it went well um, but the fact is I didn't quite know how it happened. So, I mean, the pastor asked me, Hey, that went pretty well. I want you to do it again in the next service. And I, I was like, uh, I, I, I sincerely without any false modesty, don't know if I can. So I remember going up to the staff bathroom, locking myself in, splashing water on myself and saying, what just happened? <laughs> Uh, it, it was, it, but it was one of those experiences, the validity of which came later, mm. kind of uh, where I realized of all the things that had happened that day, that life changing day, I was never nervous. Hmm. It was, I mean, I don't know how, I don't know why. I mean, it might be that like, 
you know, God swooped down and, and supernaturally took the butterflies uh, out at the last second. Or it could be that I realized that without realizing it, I had been doing hmm. things like it all along. And so I was more like Daniel's son. I was more ready right. um, to defend my skinny behind against Johnny and the skeleton suit kids than I could have realized. Right. Wow. I sure hope that our listeners also lived during the 80s at some point. Most most likely okay. they did. Otherwise, they're going to be <laughs> yeah, they're lost. They're like Daniel's son. <laughs> but I think Will Smith's kid did a remake of Karate he Kid. Did. So. <laughs> he did. So, so <laughs> much Jackie lacking. Chan. <laughs> yeah. There's only one Mr. Miyagi. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that, I mean, that's really cool to think about, though, as far as you, know, you look at where life had brought you, where God had put you throughout your life and the positions that you had held and the things that you had done, you know, really probably in the moment you, you wouldn't think about it, but then looking back, you're like, Oh, that's, that's pretty interesting. Like I was put in these different positions in different places so that when that time come, I was ready for it. Right. You know, and I think a lot of times as, um, you know, creatives or entrepreneurs or successful business people, you know, we don't look at, the things that we're doing as something that's going to help us in the future. You know, a right. lot of times, you know, especially in our world today, everyone's just so negative, right? It's either too cold or too hot or it's Monday or, you know, they're, and they're, they're always looking at what's bad about the current situation that they're in opposed to saying, wow, the current situation I'm in, um, I may not prefer it right now, but I know that it's molding and shaping me and making me into somebody that I'm going to be someday. Absolutely. Or, you know? Absolutely. You know, yeah. uh, I, I think the um, the fact is that a lot of entrepreneur, creative, driver, builder types would identify with uh, the the significance being lost on me in the moment. Um, not only that, but I, I probably did whatever moment it was in spite of whatever underlying significance might be there, thinking I can't wait till, or let's hurry up and get on to. A and of course, looking back with a bit of wisdom and a little bit of gray over the temples, I can recognize that it was in those times I wished I could hurry up and get through that, um, that I was becoming mm. without even realizing it right under my own nose. Yeah. And I think, I think the other thing about your story that I think is interesting and that we can all take something from is... Um, the fact that you said yes, even though you weren't sure that you could do it. <laughs> <laughs> or that's insanity, one or the other. I mean, I'm not well, sure. One or the other. It's insane or, or whatnot. But I think that in my own life where I've seen massive growth and opportunity is when I just committed yeah. to something or said yes to something that I was a little afraid of doing, that I was a little of like, I don't know if I can do this, but I'm going to Google it and figure it out. You right, know? right. I mean, it was literally that. <laughs> right. So true. Yeah. So that's, so that's awesome. So, so now you're given this platform. You have this opportunity to start practicing, essentially, preaching from time to time. Um, and then at any point, did you have some sort of authority where they gave you any type of like group or something where you could kind of speak and talk on a regular basis. Yeah. It, it grew into, uh, into my primary job. It was something I did on the side while carrying my boss's bags and helping him get ready for his meetings, uh, and traveling the world with him. The, um, the, the next installment probably came when he became, um, unable to keep leading both our Saturday night and Sunday morning and Sunday night services because of his travel schedule and the ages of his kids, which makes sense. It became unsustainable. So again, to my astonishment, he called me into his office and said, would you consider taking the Saturday night service? Um, and so I, I was pretty much the occasional um, guest speaker, boy wonder, that was kind of the role lane I was in. And I realized that I, I didn't feel at all equipped or have any clue how to be the pastor for a congregation, a, a sort of congregation lit within right. a church and prepare and deliver sermons, messages, and lead services on a weekly basis. Very different from stepping into a service that's led by someone else and bringing your home run message. Right. And so that was very formative. It was challenging and it was, uh, it was thrilling. And I did that for seven Seven years, uh, yeah. leading the evening service on Saturday night, and then when we we uh, built a larger building, we consolidated the two evening services onto Sunday night, and I led that larger congregation. And that was so formative, both in learning how to hone my craft as a communicator, mm -hmm. as well as learning how to uh, to shepherd a flock, right? To care for a group of people and and provide spiritual direction. While I myself was a was a young man, very much learning, growing, and becoming. Yeah. Wow. So. You're 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 in the 
midst of doing something that you feel God has called you to do, uh, you're having lots of success, you're giving lots of opportunity, and you're continuing to do this. Um, and so uh, where are we uh, at as far as you starting to have that call in your mm-hmm. heart to start your own thing and, and do your own? Yeah, so the, the seeds of entrepreneurism um, lay un... un- Fertilized. <laughs> what happens to seeds before they sprout? It's like, uh, anyway, they just lay there in yeah. the ground, right? Um, dormant. And, dormant, yeah. And, and for a while, because I was learning a whole new identity and a whole new set of mm. uh, learning to develop and use a whole new set of muscles. Um, but little by little, my wife and I started detecting that we're a we're once again the outsiders. I, I found myself remembering what it felt like to be the new kid in, an, in a, a long established town where everyone but me spoke like Matt Damon and then being the, the non-rich kid in the school full of, uh, of wealthy, empowered ones. And, uh, and, and that was because we were, we were in Colorado Springs, right? And if you've been to Colorado Springs, you know this. It's kind of like one big suburb without an herb. <laughs> It's right. like yeah. it's like five hundred thousand people all living in Highlands Ranch, but there's no downtown. Yeah. And 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 we all liked it, mostly, except my wife and I found ourselves like stealing away to Denver for date nights or um to go to the symphony or to want to, you know, um go to see a professional sports contest or go to the theater. And I don't mean to sound like an urban snob, it's just that we didn't even know it was a value for us. Uh we just enjoyed eating at restaurants that did not end in apostrophe S, you know. Right. Um and there's just Chili's, there's there's, there's like six of them in Colorado Springs. <laughs> We went to all of them and we decided to go to Denver. Right, exactly. Fridays and all those where the server sits down next to you and is like, I'm going to be taking care of you tonight. Right. That whole deal. Uh, we, we just found ourselves with a little bit more of an urban soul mm-hmm. is what we thought. So then we'd be going up to Denver for weekends. And, and before long, we started not being able to shake this reality. The fact that Colorado Springs is kind of Jesus land, right? Mm. And, and for good reason. You know, there's a lot of good churches and ministries, and it's a, he- a headquarters of evangelical activity. Uh, I, our biggest challenge, in, in a sense, was finding a, a, a non-Christian neighbor to invite to our Easter passion play and, and beating the other six new lifers <laughs> on the block to them. Right. You know, we're going to outserve them, and we're going to have better pie with them, and then they're going to want to come with us. Uh, whereas we would go to Denver and g- realize that the message kind of in the air was, if you want Jesus, you go down to the Springs. He left Denver like 10, 15 years mm-hmm. ago. And so we had a city here with a couple million people at the time and fast growing since then, uh, where the, the, the nexus of, of wealth, influence, um, commerce, uh, and industry in our probably three or four state region was, and uh, where there was vastly less influence for Jesus, the Bible, um, and and the local church than the place that we would drive back to every time. And then we started asking ourselves, but not wanting to say it out loud, why are we driving back? Hmm. And I remembered one time that Jesus said, the healthy don't need a doctor, the sick do. And he said it when the religious people got on him for hanging out with people that weren't like them, the, the, the riffraff. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it just kind of rattled around in my heart. My wife um, probably knew sooner than I did. And when I finally dared mention it, thinking I was going to destabilize our life, by this point we had a couple of babies and uh, a, a, a bunch of friends. And right. you know we couldn't go out to a restaurant without somebody congratulating us for being us and wanting to buy our dinner. I mean, everything was good. Yeah. And yet, by the time I got the courage up to mention the unsettledness that was that was coming uh, to be in me, my wife was kind of like, I've been waiting for you to say that. I've been wow. waiting for you to know. And so then began the, the process of the beginning of the end. Yeah. So it sounds like it was a little bit of a struggle then internally for you as far as starting to have that sense, that feeling, but then afraid of like, I don't want to mess up this, what's going good. I mean, did you ever have those fears of like, is this really God's voice or <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> am I trying to get derailed oh, by yeah, because the enemy? <laughs> I'd go back and, and life in Colorado Springs was if, if, if under fulfilling in the total context was comfortable, safe and, and wonderful. And, and to boot, I was in an organization that was kind of like uh, the church I, I worked at. It was kind of like, um, it's like the mafia without the crime, right? Um, they take great care of you and you're part of the family and everything until you try to leave. And then like you wake up with a horse head in your bed. Um, or it was, it was kind of like the island 
you know, uh, where in Lost, yeah. uh, where it, it's wonderful and magical, but slightly, something slightly off and you don't know what it is, but then you get in the boat and try to sail away and it sucks you back in. You're right. it, that's how it was when I would watch people try to leave. Like um, but there wasn't really others or anything. Um, and, and <laughs> there was no mystic yeah, smoke. There, there, there was no smoke monster, like <laughs> dragging them into the tree canopies once every, you know, one episode per each season. Yeah. That didn't happen. But, um, up until that point, minus the bloodletting and, and wanton violence, it, it was yeah. kind of like the Island. And so that reinforced the hesitation mm-hmm. to step out. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs would identify with that, with the, the counting of the cost, right? Uh, I'm leaving behind something that's good. It's not really entrepreneurism that makes us step out of a bad situation. It's more like Mm self-preservation. But stepping out of a good situation, that makes you really test whether this is this is a calling, this is who you are, or whether it's just some bad pizza or a wild hair. Right, right. (laughs) A a, a spot of cheese. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly, exactly. Um, So at this point, do you feel like you have to tell your boss or are you afraid to bring anything up about leaving or you feel like, oh, you know, I mean, what? Yeah. You know, I didn't, I didn't have a lot of examples I have to say, and I'm not looking to throw anyone on the bus. No one does it all right. I'm a yeah. boss now and you know, who, uh, I am the pot calling the kettle black, but, <laughs> but uh, I was a little hesitant to bring it up because I just hadn't see that, hadn't seen that go well right. before people who had wanted to leave for what I thought might be good or legitimate reasons were right. sort of, um, um, uh, it didn't go that well. Right. right? Yeah. So uh, I was hesitant, but at some point I thought, well, um, I either play some game or I just do the best I can do. The Bible says, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all people. I think the implication there is that there comes a point after which it doesn't depend on you. You do it as best you can and then let the chips fall as they may. So finally I told him, um, he kind of freaked out a little bit at first. Right. Um, there was some unhealth that was evidencing in his life that manifest a year later in a, in a, a painful leadership transition, which actually had the effect of keeping me a little longer in the nest than I otherwise probably would have, would have chosen. Right. Um, but o- over time he came around and mm-hmm. at the end of the day, I thought I don't need anyone else's permission. I don't need anyone else's support. I would like it. Right. But I don't need it. Right. This is my calling. This may or may not be theirs. Right. And so I'm going to do the best I can to honor everyone, especially those who made a way for me when I had no idea of the way. Um, but I'm going to do what I think um, is, is, is the path marked out for me. Wow. Okay. So now you say, I'm going to start a church, but you're living in Colorado Springs, <laughs> and you want to start this church in Denver. Right. <laughs> So how does that work out? And how did you initially, like, did you have friends and other people around you that kind of wanted to support you and, and joined you on this mission? I mean, tell us a little bit about that journey as far as having the idea, the calling, sharing that, kind of being on the same page with your wife, which is a huge deal, obviously, because, you know, she plays a big role and. Mm-hmm. And you know your life and, and helping you in that. And so, what does that look like? That transition. Yeah. Well, I was fortunate on the on the front of my wife not to have the experience that many entrepreneurs have of having to convince my family or having right. to do this in spite of the hesitations of of my partner. Yeah. Um, she was all in and enthusiastic. She's a go getter. I mean, she's. She, I feel like I need to go home and take a nap after <laughs> after talking vision with her. She runs circles around me. So that was uh, was was all systems go. Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, I've heard I had a, an older mentor and entrepreneur tell me one of the confirmations. Be wary of this as the primary impetus, but one of those signposts along the way saying, "Attaboy, you're going in the right direction." Is when others. Uh, recognize and affirm the sense of calling or direction that you're Mm. pursuing. And then when some of them uh, want to put skin in the game, it's easy for people to say, hey, good job, go get them. I believe in, I'm praying for you, right? Right, That's what you say in my world. I'm praying for you, brother. But um, it's even easy for people to throw money at it because that has a beginning and an end. But when people are willing to throw their life at it and get in the Mm -hmm. saddle with you, that's a major bolster of confidence and I think a real confirmation. So two of my closest friends and their families said, hey, if you do this, we're with you. We're in. And so we went as a, as a threesome of staff, six of us, six adults, and then a, a small uh, herd of children, herd of children uh, and, and stepped out. So that, that um, bolstered me in courage and in faith. 
uh, to do that. And then I quickly faced a couple of, of real and challenging um, points of opposition. One is that I, I learned what we all learn when we move um, from a, a suburban or rural context to an urban one, and that is that however close Denver and Colorado Springs might be geographically, they're a world apart culturally. Yeah. And by Denver, I mean Denver, yeah. not the metro. Southeast Aurora. Yeah, right. I mean, uh, Highlands Ranch or Parker would have a lot more in common with Colorado Springs. But uh, where we felt unequivocally led was to Denver, the city. And mm-hmm. Denver, the city, has much more in common with major metropolitan regions in our country than with the giant suburb minus the herb uh, of Colorado Springs. Right. So there was a steep culture curve. And uh, which we were thrilled about, but realized we had a lot of learning to do. And then there was the um, context of a global economic recession getting started. Mm. And I since learned, um, this took some graduate course study, that um, the onset of a global economic recession is a suboptimal context for hanging up a shingle and starting a nonprofit. Right. (laughs) Like, hey. so, this is not by the book. <laughs> yeah. I, I should have seen some of the subtle warning signs visible on the distant horizon, <laughs> like nonprofits taking down their shingles and, right. and people going into real estate at breakneck pace. Right. Um, but uh, I didn't. At least I, I thought, oh, well, if God's called me to this, he's going to make it happen, which at the end of the day, he did. Yeah. Um, but that was a lesson in, in learning to lead lean mm. and be frugal because right. we came into be in our first four years of organizational existence, defied all economic odds. Yeah. So we're talking 2007, 2008 This then? was eight, nine, and 10. Okay. was kind of the formative years. Okay. Um, right when the housing market started grinding to a halt. And, you know, I, I actually, we, we started a church, you mentioned this, in Denver um, called Denver United. But we lived in Colorado Springs, and we started in our basement there. And the reason was um, not very spiritual. It was that we couldn't sell our house because yeah. we didn't know what a lot of people didn't know, and that was what 2008 was going to be and what we were doing, which was actually joining a fraternal order, a nationwide fraternal order of, like, accidental landlords, <laughs> people that had to move for work or some other reason right. and just couldn't sell their house because the real estate market gridlocked. And so you figured, well, I either rent it out or short sell it. Didn't want to hand the keys to the bank and handcuff my family to be able to buy for the future. So we rented it out, but not before uh, having to start there. We couldn't sell the house. And we're like, well, we have a basement. The right. rent's cheap and the, the cost in Denver is astronomically higher. Um, and we still live here. So we actually gathered in our basement in Colorado Springs and um, the founding crew is six, three couples, six of the Caucasianist people you have ever known. <laughs> Myself, my wife, and four others, right? And, and, and socioeconomically uh, similar in the, in the, squarely in the middle class, conservative, religious, right, Republican. And we lived in the veritable shadow of fortress focus on the family. Right. And, and so there we were in my basement in Colorado Springs, the six of us calling ourselves Denver United with a vision to unite across the spectrum, you know, young and old, rich and poor, brown and white, the whole thing. But really, in point of fact, we were more um, literally Colorado Springs homogenous. <laughs> Than Denver United. And that's where we had our humble beginnings, wow. hoping that people wouldn't notice <laughs> that there were like 60 miles between us and the namesake of our church. Oh, that's awesome. So that this is, is probably a, a, a play-by-play <laughs> textbook example of how not to do this thing. Right. <laughs> so then, so you start this, you start Denver United in Colorado Springs in your basement. With six with, of the with, whitest people you with know. With six of the whitest people. <laughs> Um, and you, you just keep plugging along and you have that hope and that vision of, you know, moving to Denver, the city, right? We're in an economic downturn. So you obviously can't sell your home, I'm assuming, or because yeah. no one's buying homes. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and so you decide to, what took that leap of faith or what took the, you to that point saying, all right, like we have to make it to Denver. Yeah. Like, we need to whatever it costs, like get up there and start, you know, following God. Probably my neighbors complaining that we had like (laughs) dozens and dozens of cars every Friday night. And they're like, what the heck are you doing? And so uh, it got unruly and we needed a place. And at that point, renting a place um, was, was, 
the the inevitable next step, and it made no sense not to do it in Denver. So I actually commuted to Denver to pastor a local church there from Colorado Springs for about the first year, year and a half. Okay. And we started renting a place in Denver, um, and, and that's where it, it took its its earliest form in the metro region, which lent it the name. <laughs> nice. And so from that point, you're you know, full swing. I mean, as far as you're renting a space, you, you, you starting this church, what was it like for you as far as your thoughts or ideas on how to grow your church or how to get the word out about Denver United? And, um, you know, what were some of the struggles and, and the things that you navigated over those first, you know, few years? You know, it was actually a blissfully simple time because I just didn't have much. We didn't have much going on. The church was an idea. It was a handful of people. If even in church parlance, it was like a big, small group at this point. I mean, maybe a hundred people, mm. right? So it was a medium-sized group, but um, there wasn't a lot to do except meet people. And so I met every person who was willing to have breakfast, lunch, dinner, coffee, midnight snack, pie and ice cream at Village Inn or otherwise. I was like the hobbits, you know, like second <laughs> breakfast. And um, and fortunately, my, my metabolism, I'm really tall and skinny, my metabolism was like a tool of the trade, because I just burn through right, the calories. And, um, but um, it was it, the, the church where I had come from was kind enough to give me the list, you know, like the knock list, the list yeah. of people <laughs> in in Denver, the Denver metro area that, that had come to their church. Big churches cast big shadows. And my rationale was, look, if they're in the Denver area, uh, if they're in the Springs area, I don't want them. And if they're in the Denver area, how well are we really servicing them? Come on, that's an hour away. Right. So they gave me the list. I called every single one of them. That's what I did. I just called every one of them. And then I asked, you know, I, I kind of felt like I was doing multi-level marketing. Can you give me the name of three friends? <laughs> do, you, do you have three people in your life that would benefit from my church? How, how do you feel about residual income? You know, so I was drawing it upside down in the napkin, the whole deal. I just met with people. And I, I, I was kind of like Bono. All I had was, was a red guitar, three chords, and the truth. All I had was a map of Denver and a vision for a church that reflected the city and Jesus' heart for unity across the spectrum, uh, the spectra that divide people, not just people in religion but people in society, you know, young and old, rich and poor, brown and white, urban, suburban, married, single, kids, no kids, Democrat, Republican, cool and uncool. They tend not to, you know, I grew up in Boston, right? So it was probably the most segregated city in America, at least in the 80s. I didn't get as much attention as LA because we didn't beat each other with pipes. We just sort of <laughs> left one another alone. But you got Hanover Street and you got like the Irish neighborhood on this side and the Italian neighborhood on that side. And people would literally go their whole lives and never cross the street. And I imagine Jesus standing on the top of Faneuil Hall, grabbing people from this neighborhood and that neighborhood and pulling them together against that like centrifugal force of yeah. culture that pushes us out and makes us suspicious and fearful and ultimately hateful and bringing them together. It's why Jesus, if you'll let me just talk about him real yeah. quick, he's my guy, right? Uh, he prayed one thing that the Bible records for us, the future, me and my ilk, the future of his church back 2,000 years ago. It wasn't that we'd be like holy or that we'd be um, well put together, loving or otherwise. He probably wanted those things, but it was that we would be one. Because he knew that in our unity, I think, the world uh, watching us that didn't have regard for Jesus or religion would see a picture of Jesus lived out and on display. So that was the heart. That was the hope. And I basically told that story over and over again uh, to anyone who would listen for wow. a year and a half. Yeah. And then from there, because you know, I look at Denver United, and I have friends who started churches in a similar time and they maybe only have 20, 30 members, and they're meeting in elementary school still after several years. You know, what do you attribute to the success or growth that's taken place over the past several years? Because I would say it's pretty abnormal of how well the church has done, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, that's the million-dollar question. I get asked that a, a decent amount by young church um, pioneers, and uh, I wish I had two easy to swallow capsules to give them, um, and I would buy a Caribbean island or something. But um, here's what I think. First, I mentioned that um, toward the tail end of my time as an associate at the large church in the Springs, we went through a painful and very public uh, leadership scandal and ultimately transition. Um, and I think the fast start could be most honestly attributed to God's um, um, consolation prize to me for not murdering my boss. 
<laughs> it's like, well done. Or he just felt so bad for me. I'm like, man, you got to catch that bomb. That was a sucky trial by fire. And so let's make this next go easier on you. I, I think there might have been some of that. So, so, it's great. But but because I mean, it's not to say I didn't contemplate murder at times, you know, and, and like by violent, irrationally violent means. Have you ever gone through something super traumatic where you find yourself um, disturbed at your thought life, like? wanting to slice him up into small strips and drop him into a vat of boiling acid, yeah. violent and deviant. And so not doing that might be the secret sauce. <laughs> uh, but, but I think, uh, I mean, it, I'm only half joking there. I think seriously, um, the, some of the things I've since learned um, and, and picked up along the way that are common across the spectrum of entrepreneurial endeavor are keeping focused and keeping simple, right? So mm -hmm. the temptation is um, to overestimate our mandate for nuance, I think. Because I'm starting something of which there are many already, I need to clearly pronounce to the world why my thing is new, different, novel, um, and we over-niche and, and perhaps over differentiate. And so my bar for admission and, 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 and enthusiastic full body participation was very low. Hmm. Like, do you, do you know who Jesus is? <laughs> you know, like when, uh, when Dennis Miller would interview people on the sidewalk, <laughs> like, do you breathe? Yeah. <laughs> and then, okay, you're good. We'll figure the rest out along the way. Right. So it's a very low bar um, because when you start anything, mm -hmm. Right, uh, and I say this at the risk of some of my beloved um, fellow co-founders listening. Um, you tend to attract the fruits and nuts a little bit because they are the ones that are up for an adventure too. And it's one level of crazy to be up for your own adventure where you heard the voice inside right. and you know that you know that it's realer than the chair underneath you. It's another level of <laughs> crazy yeah. to go with someone else's thing. Like, did you really hear that? Right. Like, was it an? audible voice right. or was it like a, an impression, <laughs> you know? So those people, there's another layer of like wild west factor when you get into that crowd. And right. I, I, I just had some people tell me, just say yes. You want to do that? Yes. It's just, is this church about yes. Could we, could you ever imagine the church? Yeah. Where are that? Are you the kind of church that you bet we are? I mean, if church and Jesus were somewhere in the Three paragraph narrative. The right. answer was yes. yes, because here's the thing. Not only is that um, perhaps good business practice, but I think it was Jesus way when I studied his life, not for theology or personal enrichment, but for an entrepreneurial blueprint. What I found was this startlingly simple fact hidden in plain sight all through the Bible's accounts of his life. And that is this. Jesus made a living out of meeting people where they were at, hmm. not where he thought they ought to be or wish they would go. And then earning the right, building trust, and over time accessing their hearts to lead him where he knew that God wanted him to go. And so I figure if it was good enough for him in building his thing, it's probably good enough for me. Yeah. What are some of the, the hard things that you've, you've had to experience or the things that were difficult in starting a church, in mm. you know, managing people, what are, what are some mm. of those hurdles that you've had to overcome or, or things that have been challenging? You know, I think we learn um, as we grow in life and in emotional intelligence that um, nobody cares about us as much as we do. Nobody's probably, I tell my teenager this a lot, no one's thinking about you as much as you think they're thinking about you, honey, because <laughs> the thing is they're thinking about themselves, right? right? <laughs> And so in, in business, in entrepreneurship, um, that's true in spades. Nobody cares as much as I cared, right? They ought to want it to be good as much as I did, maybe in, a, in some heavenly rubric. But the fact is, they cared about their own things. They had their own dreams. This was a part of their life and a fairly small part. And so I had to learn to be good with that. Uh, and, and some of the mistakes I made had to do with my over-responding uh, out of the depth of passion to decisions people made that, that I wrongly expected to be as uh, rooted in this calling, this vision, as I am. So what that would look like is um, being not hurt, but like devastated when people would go away or needing things to mean more. It couldn't just be that, you know what, we came for a while and it was good, but then we, we liked the 
the fact that Red Rocks plays in the Wash Park Volleyball League. So we went there. I'm like, all this that we've been through together <laughs> and you're going to leave for that? What's the real thing, man? And I like, grab him by the lapels and like, come on, level with me. God is our witness. What's going on in your soul? And really it was just that they... Like, like volleyball. Yeah, or they found that most of them liked a girl who liked volleyball and went to Red Rocks. And I was like, how can you do this thing to me? We're in the trenches together. And what I realized is I'm in the trenches. Not everybody and very few, if anyone beyond my wife, was called to be there to the depth that I was. And being getting okay with that, that was the hardest lesson. And I, I flubbed that one in several directions. And there's probably someone going to listen to this that was the recipient of such a flubbing. And I'm, I'm sorry. I'm really genuinely sorry for over-responding mm. out of the depth of emotion that came with um, doing this thing. Yeah, that's awesome. Now, what about as far as keeping people inspired and you know, being a leader? Everyone's looking to you mm. uh, during different seasons and times of hardship and growth and all that. How how did you stay, um, you know, solid? I mean, w- did, did you have mentors in your life or people who you go to so that you can kind of continue to be a rock for the people mm. around you? Or yeah, you know, there's I think a um, a blissful naivety that's almost necessary to do anything entrepreneurial. You have to be. You have to not know what's going to come. If you read too many books and know too much, or if somehow you were able to flash forward, I think for me anyway, I'll just talk about myself, I, I would probably not have done it. I would have stayed home and watched daytime television and eaten ice cream out of the carton. And, you know, <laughs> I, I just gone fetal, right? I, I don't know that I could have done it. But then there comes an awakening, a sort of entrepreneurial adolescence. For me, it was three to four years in where the novelties worn off. The things that I did that were wonderful and amazing were now a little... Um, uh, old hat. And it was a little like, um, there was a little Tina Turner, you know, what have you done? Was that Tina Turner? What have you done for me lately? Yeah. I right? think so. Pointer sisters? Mm, no. I think Tina Turner. You, anyway, I'm not singing it. You should sing it. <laughs> if you guys don't know, this man can sing. I've dabbled. Yeah. <laughs> you've dabbled. Right. So, um, <laughs> so there's a little of that. And then that, that was very unsettling. Cause I'm like, I don't know what else I, I don't, I've, I've got nothing. This is it. It was easier in a way when it was just me on a stool in front of a map in Denver, talking about rich and poor, young and old, brown and white, urban and suburban, Republican and Democrat, cool and uncool, Highlands to Highlands Ranch, Jesus standing on the top of Faneuil Hall. When it, when they're like, okay, yeah, we've, we've heard that. What's new. Mm. Uh, and com- commensurately, when the church started to become more multifaceted, we had a youth ministry, we had um, groups and and mission trips and and uh, urban outreach to the city. It it, it, um, it became harder to, in a way, get above the the clouds, see the road ahead, and inspire people to go. Because I felt like I was bogged down in just managing this machine that had come to be. And so, yes, mentorship was huge in that, mm-hmm. um, and then. Uh, so maybe I should talk about that first. Mentorship was huge, yeah. and then there's one other idea that kind of comes to mind. Um, having a couple of people outside of my world who, one, didn't think I was dazzling, and two, um, had done something bigger, better, or uh, different than what I'm doing, mm-hmm. um, who can contextualize this in, uh, in the, the course of human events. Like, this is possible. This can happen. It's not, the, the wheels aren't coming off the bus. You're waking up in year three and it's lost that love and feeling and, and you don't know if you want to go to work. Um, that can happen. This is okay. Mm. This, is, um, this is not abnormal. Uh, having people contextualize and desensationalize my experience uh, was, was really big. And then having people uh, help me contextualize my endeavor in a broader scope Mm. that, um, first, I'm not the first person to do something entrepreneurial, and church isn't the only way this happens. People are doing this all throughout the year, all across the country and around the world. And so here's some of the best practices. Here are some of the lessons learned. I started, in addition to reading um, books by older pastors, I started to read like Harvard Business Review Mm -hmm. and find that even companies that spawn... um, new businesses or guys that leave a a large corporation to go start their own tech firm have many of the same experiences that I'm having. And there's a lot of wisdom out there if you're willing to look at it in a cross-disciplinary light. Hmm. Wow. 
Well, um, yeah, I really appreciate you coming on the show and, and sharing your story. Um, so what, what's, I have a few other questions. I have, um, just some more personal off the top, um, kind of stuff, but, um, where do you, where do you see your endeavor going? Where do you see your church going? Like what, what's your vision for, um, you know, continual growth or, you know, what, what does that look like for you? I think foremost, it's staying in the city Mm -hmm. and that would seem self-evident unless you do, um, some sort of industry that requires more um, square footage, you understand that square footage gets less and less available with every notch up you go in your need and more and more expensive. So finding a space to do um, what I do, but to double it, say um, 1,200 seats and 50,000 square feet um, with commensurate parking and support space, it's just... Uh, improbable. I just don't see it in Denver. So what yeah. churches typically do if they experience growth is they then compromise on location that you give on place. And that's not to say that's wrong. I just don't feel like it's what we're supposed to do. So the path would be to go out to the frontiers of the suburbs and buy a bit of field and put up a big box and build a mega church, right? And that's fine. The suburbs need Jesus too. It's just in my judgment, they're getting him in disproportionate supply, Mm. right? So we made a commitment that um, the vision starts with staying put, that place matters. So Denver is where Denver United is always going to be. And that poses some real logistical problems. I don't view buildings and, and real estate as vision. I view them as bricks and mortar and dirt, which are going to um, crumble and and go back to dust, but they facilitate vision and they can cap vision, right? So um, probably what we will do is max, figure out how to uh, ever better steward and ultimately optimize the space we have. And that means getting creative. We do three Sunday morning services where the paradigm of church I came from in the Springs, optimal was two. We've shortened, nipped, tucked, and figured out how to do three. You don't fill them all up because you have sort of a prime time. Then you add services in the evening. What we lack in more square footage, we have in spades with regard to depth of talent. We've got a deep bench of great leaders. My problem isn't wherever would I find another communicator so I don't have to preach every night of the week. It's how do I get enough minutes to play all the talented leaders on my bench mm. to go sports on you for a second, right? <laughs> so um, so probably it would be replicating on nights of the week, using the space more, more optimally, and then ultimately replicating by taking what we um, have built here and going on the other side of the city um, and then doing the same thing. So where we sit there near Washington Park, um, Broadway and I-25 would become um, Denver United South, and then we would have a, a another um, semi-autonomous, corporately um, consolidated um, congregation or community that is Denver United with the complexion that reflects the leadership and the community uh, in which it's situated, and then likewise to the East and the West. The aim to keep them um, consolidated on the back end isn't really a design to have a little denomination of my own, but more uh, for an economy of scale, because it's so expensive to do life, business, and ministry in the heart of this city, and it's only becoming more so. That is a way to, to, to leverage um, talent and not have to reinvent the wheel. Mm. So that's how I see it growing. Ultimately, we envision four communities and the four compass points, north, south, east, and west around Denver. Um, united with a common vision and heartbeat and corporate backside with a backside's not what I meant. Yeah. Backside back end, back back end. Back Thank end. you. <laughs> I said that and Mark's eyebrows went up. <laughs> corporate backside. backside. <laughs> so, so strike that from the record. <laughs> corporate back end. <laughs> and then uh, an urban outreach mission right in the center. Um, that that's the beating heart that has a, a two direct two directional arrow to each of the congregations and is the tie that binds. It's us representing Jesus as we understand him in very practical ways um, to the most marginalized in our city. Hmm. That's awesome. Well, uh, so I have a few just fun questions that I want to ask you. Uh, Simple stuff just to kind of know more about you. Uh, What was your first car? Do you remember your first car? Heck yeah, 1986, two-door Volkswagen Jetta diesel. And I'm convinced my parents did that. They talked about gas mileage, but you could hear the thing coming from down the street and around the corner. (laughs) So there was no sneaking in under the cover of nightfall with this thing. (laughs) 
a great had roll mileage. up windows, but man, I got like 45 yeah. miles a gallon. That's awesome. What about your first job? What was your first job? Well, as a paper boy um, okay. from, from young, because I always wanted to be older. I always wanted to be farther along. I had great visions to have a car. And the way I had a car, not having wealthy parents, um, was I delivered newspapers early in the morning and I saved up the money and I had the car sitting there in the driveway. My dad said he would match whatever I could earn. So I started at like 11 and I had the car waiting when I got my license at 16 and a half. <laughs> that speaks a lot to... What about yeah? So I had to spend like the <laughs> second half of my adult life undoing everything that had me so wound up from my overachieving youth. But what about um, therapy? A lot of <laughs> therapy. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, what about any any really good uh, resources or anything like that that you'd recommend to you know people who are looking to become better leaders, become better communicators? Uh, yeah, totally. Uh, well, I mentioned it before. I believe leaders are readers, and I think the Harvard Business Review is is a lingua franca for entrepreneurs. If it's relevant to me, people doing church, it's relevant to you. Mm-hmm. But what I love about it is it's the brainiac crowd writing things that are like a page and a half. You can read it almost at a stoplight if you're fast. You can read it Okay, I'm just going to say it. You can read it in the bathroom. Yeah. We all do it. <laughs> yeah. Might as well say it, right? You can read it while you're mm. waiting for your for your burger to be delivered. And so um, I, I will read one of those a week or, or two. And uh, it's a free app. Um, I think you can probably subscribe if you read them voraciously. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's le- business leaders who are practitioners and then analysts of business mm. applying simple lessons like don't overestimate your mandate for change. When you take over, friends, you are the change. So think scientific method. Hold everything constant that you can and change one variable at a time and then assimilate and observe, right? Things like that, practical um, nuggets that you can do tomorrow morning to be a more effective leader. So that's one, uh, very simple and practical. Um, um, Lonely and isolated as you go up is a self-fulfilling prophecy. I'm convinced that nobody became the leader who cracked under the pressure because he was all alone or she was all alone. Um and chose it. No one sat around like my boss when he was our age, didn't sit around thinking, boy, when I'm 15 at the top of my game and on the cover of magazines, I'm going to go down in a blaze of glory and bring shame on my family and all the people I know. No one plans that, right? It's a path of least resistance. Mm -hmm. And so resist that path and invest in relationships like the friendship I have with you, Mark, take time to allow people in who don't think you're that big of a deal. If you only relate to people who are in awe of you or who want something from you, then you're a, a leadership meltdown waiting to happen. Wow, that's awesome. What about, um, uh, has there been a book or something you've read that you, you've bought in, like a copy to give to somebody because you're like, you have to read this book. Mm. It, it's so good, you know? So many. Um Okay, how about this? For leaders, emotional intelligence. Mm. Pick up emotional intelligence and invest in that quantity in your life and you'll invest in everybody you lead. That's awesome. Um, Can you just give one quick snippet of advice or encouragement to maybe a young guy out there who's starting his own church and, um, you know, needs a little bit of encouragement or, you know, just one word of something that you can say to that guy, you know? It doesn't have to look like the best practice models in order to be good. It doesn't have to be big, prosperous, or influential to be good. It has to be honorable, true, and valuable in people's lives and to God. And that makes it good. Be where you are and allow God to take you where he wants you to go. Awesome. Well, hey, thank you so much for being on the show. We really appreciate your uh, words of encouragement, your advice, and your experience and knowledge that you've um, gained over all these years. So I appreciate you, man. And, Such uh, a pleasure. We'll hopefully uh, have you on again soon. Look forward to it. All right.